Hi, let's talk about the chambers of the heart. In this video, we'll discuss the arrangement and features of the chambers of the heart, both the atria and the ventricles. We'll discuss pectinate muscles, cordy tendini, trabecula carni, and papillary muscles. We'll also discuss the atrioventricular and semilunar valves, how they work, and what they're doing during systole and diastole. Finally, we'll discuss the pattern of connection amongst vessels to each chamber of the heart, where vessels originate, and where they go. We'll also distinguish between pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. So let's start our journey in the right atrium of the heart. So blood returns from systemic circulation, largely via the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava to the heart. Also, the vasculature that drains the heart of blood, the cardiac veins, uh, drain largely into the right atrium as well. Now, the right atrium has a region into which the vena cavae drain called the sinus venerum. The sinus venerum is very smooth walled. So um, we can see here, so this is the superior vena cava, this is a portion of the inferior vena cava, and we can see precisely how smooth this wall is. We can contrast that with the anterior aspect of the, uh, of the right atrium, which is a little more uh, rigid with, with muscle. So in the image here to the right, we're looking at a posterior view of the heart. The atrium is open. There's the superior vena cava. There's the inferior vena cava reflected away. This would be a portion of that opening. And we could see the sinus venerum wall there. And this ridge here is called the crista terminalis. Oh, there it is, crista terminalis. And that is the, uh, the dividing line between the pectinate muscle that is anterior to the crista terminalis and the sinus venerum, which is posterior to the crista terminalis. That crista terminalis, if we follow it to its superior most point here, um, generally around right there, and we go much more superficial, so just underneath the, uh, the epicardium, uh, we can encounter a cluster of very specialized cardiomyocytes called the sinuatrial or SA node. This is the pacemaker region for the heart. One uh, item that we can just barely see here in the, uh, the photograph to the, uh, to the right is the interatrial septum. Um, that is the wall between the right and the left uh, atria, um, and in, in utero, uh, there are two septa, or divisions, that are slightly separated, um, and the space between these two septa is called the foramen ovale. At birth, these septa snap shut, and uh, they, they meld together. And so the foramen ovale is therefore obliterated, and that, that membranous portion, which used to conduct um, relatively oxygenated blood from maternal circulation to the fetal heart, um, is now known as the fossa ovalis. Uh, sometimes the, uh, a small space of that foramen ovale uh, remains patent or open, and that's referred to as a patent foramen ovale, or a PFO. Um, in addition, we can also see, um, it's right about there, the opening for the coronary sinus. The, the coronary sinus is the venous sinus into which the cardiac veins drain, and that coronary sinus also drains into the right atrium. So superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, coronary sinus, and some smaller veins will also drain into the right atrium. From the right atrium, blood is going to flow 
through an atrioventricular valve known as the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. So let's take a look at that now. <clears throat> so um, up here we can see this has the uh, right and left atria removed. We can see the tricuspid valve from above. And there are three cusps to the tricuspid valve. There is an anterior and a posterior and a septal cusp. And these three cusps are attached to extensions of the myocardium called papillary muscles. You can see one there, one there, and one there via ligamentous like structures that attach to the leaflets of the valves called corti tendini. These corti tendini are what the papillary muscles can pull upon during ventricular systole such that the cusps of these valves come into close approximation and therefore blood does not move retrograde from ventricle to atrium. The, uh, the papillary muscles and the corti tendini, uh, while they do apply pressure to the cusp of the uh, tricuspid valve, um, pulling on them is not what closes the valves. It's actually the pressure that builds up in the, the ventricles which closes the um, AV valves. The, uh, the papillary muscles and the, the corti tendini, they aid that pressure in approximating the valves and they prevent the, the cusps of the valves from, from inverting uh, back into the atria, but they don't, they don't pull the valves closed. That's all pressure driven. So as there were um, anterior, posterior, and septal cusps of the tricuspid valve, there is also anterior, posterior, and septal papillary muscles as well. And so we can see there is the anterior, there is the posterior, and there is the septal cusp. In association with that anterior papillary muscle, there is a structure called the septomarginal trabecula, or the moderator band. The septomarginal trabecula was actually first described by Leonardo da Vinci, um, and there were various hypothesized reasons for its uh, presence in the heart, um, but we, we now know that it conducts right bundle branch fibers uh, across to the uh, the right side of the ventricular wall. Speaking of the wall of the, the ventricle, um, it is very rugose. It is very robust with um, extravasations of, of myocardium pushing the, the endocardium in. And these are called trabeculi carni, or meaty beams. And so um, if, if you have the opportunity um, in lab or in cadaveric images to to witness this these are these are really quite impressive and and beautiful so they are arranged to um, to help squeeze the heart during diastole they are a nice um, contrast to the pectinate muscles of the atria which are much more uh, regularly arranged uh, in, in a comb like fashion um, and when they help to contract the ventricles during ventricular systole, on the right side, blood is propelled toward the conus arteriosus. The conus arteriosus, you can see a, a little bit of it there, is a rather smooth-walled portion of the right ventricle. And that feeds blood toward the semilunar pulmonary valve. So we can see that semilunar pulmonary valve there. The semilunar valves are always named for the vessels that they are entering into. So the pulmonary valve is named for the pulmonary trunk, which then divides into the main pulmonary arteries, both right and left.
So from the pulmonary arteries, which go out to the lungs, uh, where blood is um, oxygenated and carbon dioxide offloads uh, through the gas exchange of the alveoli, oxygenated blood is returned back to the heart via the pulmonary veins. And so um, in, the, uh, in the photo here, we can see, you know, the, the left atrium has been uh, bisected and reflected apart, and we can see some of these pulmonary veins. There are, there are four sets of them returning blood to the left atrium. The left atrium um, will also have some pectinate muscle uh, associated with it, um, although it's a little... Uh, less dense than the right atrium. Um, and there's also the interatrial septum in the fossa ovalis, and you'll have the opportunity to, to, to see that as well. So blood from the left atrium is going to flow through yet another atrioventricular valve, uh, this one called the bicuspid or mitral or mitral because it looks like a bishop's mitre, the, the bishop's hat. So there are two cusps here, uh, an anterior and a posterior, which we'll discuss in the context of the left ventricle. So here we can see the bicuspid valve. There, um, there are anterior and posterior cusps associated with, uh, with this particular valve, and there are chordae tendini attaching those uh, cusps of the valve to anterior and posterior papillary muscles. So we, two cusps, uh, two sets of chordae tendini, two papillary muscles. There are also uh, trabecular carni. Uh, we can see them uh, a little better in, in this particular image here, as well as the anterior and the posterior papillary muscles of the left ventricle. The left ventricle, when it goes through systole, is going to send blood superiorly up toward the aortic valve. This is another semilunar valve. Um, and the aortic valve enters into the aorta, specifically a, a portion of the aorta called the ascending aorta. Um, and the spaces above these valves are the aortic sinuses of Valsalva. So these aortic sinuses, um, which we can see here, so there is one sinus, and there is another sinus there. There are going to be three of them, uh, but only two of them are going to be coronary sinuses because these feed into the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. These are the arteries which directly supply the heart with blood. So let's look at what these valves are doing uh, during different uh, stages of the, the cardiac cycle. So just as a, as a quick review, um, systole is the process of contraction. Uh, diastole is the process of relaxation. So when I think diastole, I think dilate. And when we simplify the cardiac cycle into systole and diastole, we're referring to um, ventricular systole. Because as you'll recall, the cardiac cycle has atrial systole, then ventricular systole, then diastole, then atrial systole, then ventricular systole, then diastole. So let's look at what is happening first with those semilunar valves. So these are working in coordination with one another, both aortic and pulmonary. And you can see here in this illustration that these valves are wide open. They're open during systole because as the ventricles are contracting, they're squeezing blood uh, out these aortic and pulmonary valves, as we can see there. So this is a pressure-driven endeavor. As ventricular pressure increases, that's going to 
push blood through the pulmonary trunk and through the aorta respectively and the pressures within those vessels will also increase. Now during diastole, as the heart is relaxing and expanding, uh, pressure is going to be greater in the pulmonary trunk and aorta than it will be in the ventricles. And so the natural inclination of a fluid such as blood is going to be to be drawn back toward an area of lower pressure. Well, these cusps of the semilunar valves act as scoops and as blood hits these cusps, it brings the cusps into approximation with one another, as we can see here with these closed cusps. We can also see a nice right coronary sinus, a left coronary sinus, and a posterior sinus for the uh, ascending aorta there. Now in terms of, well, I, I should also mention that it's it's during diastole, therefore, that the coronary arteries are going to dilate with blood. Why? Because as the blood comes back towards these cusps, pressure then is going to force blood through the, the coronary arteries. So let's discuss what happens with the atrioventricular valves during systole and diastole. So different stages of the, the, the cardiac cycle. So during diastole, the AV valves are going to be wide open. Diastole, as you recall, is followed by atrial systole. So during diastole, about 75% of blood that is destined for the ventricles will flow straight through the atria and the atrioventricular valves into the ventricles. During atrial systole, the remaining 25% will be squeezed from the atria and into the ventricles. During ventricular systole, so just called systole, when ventricular pressure increases, that ventricular pressure is going to push upon the cusps of the AV valves to approximate them, so they will close, therefore. The, uh, the papillary muscles tugging on the, the cordy tendony are going to help prevent those cusps from prolapsing back into the atria, but you know this is a, a pressure-driven endeavor. So during systole, we see closure of these valves. And so we therefore can understand why the aortic and pulmonary valves are going to be open when the atrioventricular valves are closed because we want a unidirectional flow of blood. And if all the valves were open at the same time, then blood would flow into the pulmonary trunk and aorta with the same amount of pressure that it would flow retrograde back into the atria, which would not be good for the, uh, the cycling of blood. And that leads us to our assessment question, and that is, what structures anchor atrioventricular cusps to papillary muscles? Are these cordy tendony, the crista terminalis, the pectinate muscles, the septimarginal trabecula, or the trabecula carne? Well, the correct answer is cordy tendony. Cordy tendony are going to anchor cusps to extensions of the myocardium called papillary muscles. The crista terminalis is the ridge in the right atrium, so that is not correct. Pectinate muscles are the, uh, are the myocardial extravasations into the right and left atria, so that's not correct. The septimarginal trabecula is that moderator band that connects the ventricular septum to the anterior papillary muscles. That's not correct. Trabecula carni are the irregularly arranged meaty beams of the myocardium in the ventricles, so that is not correct. The correct answer is A, cordy tendony anchor atrioventricular cusps to papillary muscles. Thank you very much for your time.